everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Gary Edelman and that's Chris White behind the camera. Let me go on the other camera over and show you Chris White as well. And we are on Little Round Top at Gettysburg and this is sort of a new format for us and we'll be curious uh, to, to hear from you as to whether you like this format here. Uh, call it a walking vodcast. As we walk around Little Round Top, in case you can't visit the place uh, while uh, you are far away or if it's closed for the coming rehabilitation. It is March of 2022 and we also wanted to document what Little Round Top looks like before this rehabilitation and we can see all the great work that the National Park Service is going to do uh, when it reopens in some po at some point in 2020 three or 2024. So we're going to just walk around a little bit. Uh, we're on Little Round Top. We're looking generally to the northwest toward the first day's field way off in the distance and closer is the second day's field. We're at the tip of the Union Fish Hook, which went along Cemetery Ridge over here and it went over to that largest white monument you can probably see called the Pennsylvania Monument and curved around Cemetery Hill to Culp's Hill and there are about 85,000 Union soldiers on that line and the Confederates are on a much broader line off in the distance here. You know the deal. In the distant tree line, that's Seminary Ridge. And on Seminary Ridge, the Confederate line is huge. And this will result in a lot of the fighting here on the second day with the Confederates attacking from that tree line toward this position. And in front of here are other famous places, the Devil's Den, the Wheat Field, the Peach Orchard, and as I said, Cemetery Ridge off to your right. So uh, I'm going to let Chris go first. Let's walk around a little bit. All right, if you do come up here whenever it reopens, always be safe because there are a lot of rocks up here. They're fun to climb on, but they hurt to fall off of. I've done it before. Yes, as have I. So be careful and watch the people around you. I'm going to head off a little bit in this direction while Chris pans around. I'm going to show you a little bit of the front of this monument. This is Governor Kemble Warren. He's the chief engineer for the Union Army, and this guy knows the lay of the land topography, and he is horrified when he saw no Union troops atop this very important position. Look at the view this has. You don't need to be a military genius to see it. I see some of the troops coming into position right over there, and you don't need to be a military genius to know that you don't want to attack this thing um, if there's the enemy up top, and that's just what the Confederates are going to have to do, who are coming from that area right in the distance near the ski slopes. And this is uh, Governor Kimball Warren, as Gary pointed out. This is the first monument to a New York officer on the battlefield here. Um, it is sculpted by Carl Gerhardt, uh, placed here in 1886 uh, for the cost of $5,000. In a way, it's kind of a, a, a thank you to Warren, who died just a few years earlier um, in 1883. He said he died a disgraced soldier because of what happened at the Battle of Five Forks. He's actually relieved eight days before Robert E. Lee surrenders at Appomattox. So these are some of his friends getting together and coming to probably the most important moment of his career, standing up here on Little Round Top and then finding those troops to get him up here and to help secure the Union left. Okay, and what we're doing now, and I'm going to show it from this direction here, is going up to the very crest of Little Round Top. You can see it right here. You can see some cannons up top. I promise you they wouldn't have put those cannons there during the battle because what happens, Chris, when you fire a gun? it is going to roll backwards. It recoils. So it's going to recoil about eight feet when there's really a shell in there. It will leap off the ground and the southerner, the Union soldiers who brought these cannons up here talked about what a tremendous task it was just to get the cannons up here in the first place. It was a real challenge. Now, one of the grand stories of the battle is that supposedly on this rock here, I'm not making this up, uh, a uh, uh, a infantry commander named Weed was shot and his friend Charles Hazlitt to hear, came over to hear his friend's dying words and he was shot dead upon the body of his dying friend. You couldn't see it today but there's a rock carving uh, denoting that that is the place where it happened and that rock carving has been there since 1864. Yeah, and as you're up here, uh, we have all kinds of great photographs from just days after the battle taken from up here. And of course, the uh, the years, decades, uh, and now 100 and almost 60 years later, there's some great photographs of uh, Little Round Top looking up from the Valley of Death below us. And then, of course, uh, from Little Round Top itself looking towards the Valley of Death and then up Cemetery Ridge. And as we look off in this direction, we're looking toward Devil's Den. You can see it. Uh, right there, the rocky bulwark. The fighting down at Devil's Den was already coming to sort of its conclusion by the time the fighting really heated up on this side of Little Round Top and this area in front of it. As Chris mentioned, I believe, the Valley of Death. You can see Plum Run is beginning to flood because of some beaver activity there. But other than that, you have a very good glimpse of what the Union soldiers saw here on July 2nd, 1863. 
Now, you can see some of the reason for the coming closure. You can see erosion on and off the trails. You can see uh, sort of crumbling fence rails. You see, you will see people walking between the trails here, making what we call social trails. The hill is being loved to death. This place is famous, and it is the Park Service job, Park Service's job to steward this place in a way that is safe, but also protects the resource for centuries to come. They're not preparing for America 250 coming up. They're preparing for America 500, and they need to do some stabilization up here. They need to let it rehabilitate, make new trails, and fix the trails that are already here. I think it's important to remember that most of the Confederates do not attack from the west. You're facing out towards the mountains, you're facing out towards Seminary Ridge, you're looking closer to Hawks Ridge, of course down in the Valley of Death, Plum Run. But over here is mostly where the Confederates will attack um, this position. Uh, eventually it's, Nick, it's named Vincent Spur by a guy named John Badger Batchelder. He's the early park historian here um, and he is going to try to call Little Round Top uh, Weeds Hill. Um, that name doesn't stick, but Vincent Spur actually does stick. Uh, so down below uh, on this southern part, this southwestern, uh, southern, and southeastern part is where the Union line is going to be set up. Um, that's uh, under some guys you know, maybe named Strong Vincent from Erie, Pennsylvania, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain from Brewer, Maine, James Rice, a New Yorker with the 44th New York known as the Normal School Regiment. So we have uh, a lot of the action takes place around where Gary's starting to climb up on some rocks. So the Confederates are coming basically from the south towards the north and an ironic twist there. Taking you down to slightly lower slopes here on Little Round Top, we are closer to the first Michigan Sharpshooters Monument and coming down to the lower end of the hill where the 16th Michigan actually fought here. Uh, this is still an, a very strong position, some may say impregnable, even on its lower slopes. On this part of the hill, exactly where I walk, men of the 140th New York are going to rush into position right where you see that monument over there. Uh, and I think Chris is going to talk about them a little bit. This is uh, Patty O'Rourke. Gary may have just mentioned the 140th New York Patty O'Rourke. He is going to graduate with the war class of 1861 from West Point, 27 years old. He is going to be grabbed by Governor Kimball Warren, the chief engineer of the Army up here, and he's going to say, Patty, give me a regiment, uh, because Warren used to command the old brigade. And O'Rourke is going to send his 140th New York up here. Uh, he is going to get into this area. He is going to see Confederates, his men still in column with unloaded muskets. And he's going to say something like, down this way, boys. He is shot through the neck and mortally wounded. We see Gary up here. You see the monument to the 12th and 44th New York. 44th New York's known as the Normal School Regiment. A uh, very impressive monument, and he's standing right beside the rock where uh, uh, supposedly Colonel Strong Vincent, the brigade commander, um, of Vincent's brigade is wounded. Um, you can, might be able to make out that rock right there. And uh, about on this rock, he is uh, going to be wounded. Uh, I was going to say something along the lines of, don't give an inch, boys. Uh, carrying a riding crop while he's up there. Left his sword back on his horse uh, and is mortally wounded somewhere in this vicinity. And someone says, specifically on this rock, as it came here and carved it in stone. And here I am coming down closer to the 16th Michigan. Colonel Strong Vincent was smart. He's in command of the brigade here, and he didn't put his men behind the camera on the crest. He put them down on the military crest. On the military crest, they can still fire over the brow of the hill. On the military crest, if they have to fall back, they are still on the hill. On the military crest, the cannons up there can fire over their heads, and on the military crest, they're not forming a convenient silhouette that would make an easy target for the Confederates coming up in this direction. I'm also standing precisely at the location of where Alexander Gardner recorded a photo just days after the Battle of Gettysburg. You might be able to see those rocks in it. You could see the stone wall now tumbling down, hopefully part of the National Park Service uh, restoration as well. 
Now, I think I'm going to walk around here. Does Chris want to go into the 44th New York Monument up to the top and yeah. show the view? I'll, I'll head up that way. All right, good. I'm going to show you. You can see some of the more work of the National Park Service that's needed. You can just see erosion everywhere. People love walking around Little Rhino Top. So do I. Uh, I can't get enough of it, as a matter of fact. And that's what the Park Service is facing. They have to keep this place in shape so that it will last for centuries and indeed millennia. So they're laying the groundwork for a whole lot of good in the future. Now, as Chris goes up that monument, I don't know how much he's going to talk about, but that is to the 44th New York Monument. They're from around Albany, New York, I believe. It's also to some of the members of the 12th New York. So the interior of the chamber is 12 feet wide. The monument to the 44th New York is 44 feet 6 inches tall to the top. And they talk about their deeds and show some of their important officers on uh, bas reliefs in the middle. This is one of the most iconic monuments on the battlefield here. Uh, over on this wall, you'll see Daniel Butterfield. He's the chief of staff of the Army of the Potomac during the battle. Um, and Butterfield shows up in the in the movie Gettysburg, just be it by a mention. Um, whenever Tom Chamberlain talks about a bugle call, uh, Dan, Dan, Dan Butterfield, that's Dan Butterfield. Over here is Francis Channing Barlow. Uh, Barlow is uh, wounded several times during the war. Uh, and right here at Gettysburg on the first day of July, uh, he is commanding a division in the 11th Corps, 1st Division of the 11th Corps. So he has ties to the old 12th New York. This is the 12th and 44th New York. You'll also see up here the Maltese Cross of the 5th Corps. That is the Corps insignia of the 5th Corps. And then inside of the 44th uh, Monument here, you'll start to see the names of the men who served here. Known as the Normal School Regiment because there's so many teachers in um, this unit. Um, I also saw a, a, a little uh, article years ago that they're so close to the 83rd Pennsylvania, their sister unit, um, that they call themselves the Potomac Blues, the two together. Now we're standing up on top of the 44th New York Monument, the Castle Monument, if you will. Uh, off in that direction, straight ahead, would have been the 20th Mains position here on July 2nd, 1863. And that position would run down towards an area where you might see a guy standing about to, uh, looks like, draw his sword. That is not Strong Vincent, but it looks a lot like the guy. And that's the monument to the 83rd Pennsylvania, um, who is on the right flank of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's 20th Main. Then down here, you might see one of the uh, monuments to Strong Vincent. It looks like a tombstone. Um, that is noting one of his uh, wounding locations here. The original is actually going to uh, be broken uh, and then it's reinstalled and actually installed in the wrong direction. Uh, down below us, you'll start to see more of Vincent Spur, uh, the 16th Michigan Monument. Gary is right below us. Um, so the 16th Michigan held the right flank up here of Vincent's Brigade. Eventually we'll have Patty O'Rourke and his 140th New York coming over off to our right and down towards the Valley of Death when they make their charge. And of course we have the most famous charge, probably Gettysburg outside of Pickett's Charge, and that'll be Chamberlain's Charge of the 20th Main that took place right over in that vicinity there. Park Service, you can see that they have begun pre preparing this area here. You can see some stumps and whatnot as they get ready for the coming rehabilitation to start April of 2022, they estimate. And you're starting to see a part of the hill that looks a lot like it would have during the battle, except, and we'll walk down there, except that this would have been a, a lot more open at the time of the battle. The woods were probably much closer to where the road is now. The road, of course, was not here at the time of the battle. The men of Hazlitt's Battery, 5th, Battery D, 5th U.S., would have loved it if there was a road there at the time. All right, so we're back down here on what's called Vincent's Spur. So if you're going to set up your battle line here on Little Round Top, the Confederates are actually arcing around Seminary Ridge. You might see a White House out there on Warfield Ridge, um, the Snyder House, and then you're going to be going down uh, and eventually losing the Confederate line, which gets um, held in behind an area we'll call the Devil's Kitchen eventually. Then up here we have big round top ahead of us so what the confederates are going to do they're going to start to wrap around the left end of the union line they think that the union line ends uh somewhere along the emmitsburg road originally then dan sickles the union third corps commander moves his men forward and has to extend himself and so the left is going to end down in devil's den then eventually governor k warren shows up on this hill and he puts more union troops up here so now the union left extends even farther and out in front of us we'll have homer stoughton and his second united states sharpshooters he starts luring confederates this way and the Confederate attack will actually be broken into two pieces. Some will come towards Little Round Top, 
others will head down towards the Devil's Den. Um, and as those Confederates come up towards this way, they are going to make initial contact down with the Union so soldiers um, just in front of us. Vincent puts his, his places his men uh, down about a third of the way down the hill that's known as the Military Crest. You're not going to be silhouetted against the sky. You're, you are also going to have a fallback position. So if you lose the Military Crest about a third of the way down the hill, you can fall back to the crest of the hill. If you lose the crest of the hill, then you're out of luck. But that's going to be the idea here. So Vincent will deploy a little more than 1,300 uh, Union soldiers from New York, Maine, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, and they will be the first defenders up here on Little Round Top. Eventually, we get a battery of U.S. artillery commanded by Charles Hazlitt, um, and then we will also have Patty O'Rourke and his brigade come up here later off the Pennsylvania Reserves. So Little Round Top will, will uh, start to turn into an epicenter of Union soldiers coming up here. Now, one of the reasons they're able to access this point is because of a road network um, of interior interior lines. We have Granite Schoolhouse Lane. We have the Wheatfield Road. We have the Tawny Town Road, the Baltimore Pike under our control. So as we're Union soldiers up here, we have the advantage of interior lines, meaning it takes a lot less time to move from point A to point B. The Confederates have to march all the way around that large arc to get troops up to here and to help support us. So if that is, uh, if you're on the Confederate side, you're working on what's called exterior lines, and that is going to um, not be a great advantage to you on most battlefields. Uh, so walking down here, you can see some of the erosion that we're dealing with, uh, where the National Park Service more specifically is dealing with uh, on Little Round Top. And uh, I'll just let you take in the scene here for a few moments as we walk down towards the position of Vincent's Brigade and specifically the 83rd Pennsylvania Infantry from Erie, Pennsylvania. Here's one of those markers that I talked about. This is uh, another place where Strong Vincent was allegedly wounded, dies on July 2nd, 7th, 1863, wounded on July 2nd. The rock that uh, has the carving in it is just on the north side of the 44th New York Monument up there, the big castle. Uh, but here is this one on the south side of the hill to Strong Vincent. And of course we have the 83rd Pennsylvania's monument down there. Um, uh, in amongst the trees. I believe Vincent at this time is 26 years old, a Harvard graduate, uh, a citizen soldier who went off to war for the Federals. And he says something along the lines of, um, whenever he's mortally wounded, uh, that there's no greater honor, just paraphrasing him, there's no greater honor um, to die on the soil of old Pennsylvania underneath that flag. Uh, so that's one of the stories that come along with the death of Strong Vincent up here. After his death, uh, the brigade command turns over to Colonel James Rice of the uh, 44th New York Infantry. Rice will be a longtime brigade commander in the Army of the Potomac from here on out um, in the war. Another beautiful panorama here on the actual line of battle of the Michigan and the New York soldiers here. You can see uh, the 44th New York Monument with Chris narrating up top there. Uh, you can see some of the stone walls that were actually built right after the battle was over on the night of July 2nd and the morning of July 3rd. Uh, a lot of good at the tr did the troops then. It actually did because there's going to be constant 22 hours of skirmishing and sharpshooting going on between the hill in the distance. That's Hawks Ridge and Devil's Den there and Little Round Top. So they're going to come in most hand. Now, the troops along here, you can see the flank marker of the 16th Michigan. That's where their left flank was. And if you over toward the middle, you can see where their monument is um, on top of that uh, large boulder there. Now, originally, that monument actually sat on the ground in the weeds over here. And you can actually still see the footprint of that if you come out. That's a, um, a challenge for you if you want to do it. But later, they didn't want it sitting in a hole, so they put up put it up on here and you can see the great view they had but one thing the 16th Michigan didn't have as they had Texans and Alabama soldiers coming from here and some of the Texans starting to go off in that direction they did not have anybody guarding their flank at the time they the smallest regiment on Little Round Top the 16th Michigan are actually going to be in th in danger of being outflanked you can see their right flank marker through the uh, weeds over there or through the grass and uh, you know they through a mistaken order some of them begin to retreat back to the top of the hill and while rallying these Michiganders, that is when um, Strong Vincent will actually be mortally wounded next to the 44th New York Monument, which, to be clear, was not here during the Battle of Gettysburg. 
here with the American Battlefield Trust. We hope you're enjoying our walk around uh, Little Round Top. This is for those who can't come and who want to see more of it and for those who are unable to access it um, during the coming rehabilitation um, in the starting in the spring of 2022. The Park Service estimates it's supposed to last 12 to 18 months. So we're looking at a significant period of time, but for some significant rehabilitation. You can see the intimidating crest of Little Round Top. This is where the Battle of Little Round Top is mostly fought, on this side of the hill in front of the camera, and off to the left at a place called Vincent's Spur. Now, I already mentioned that the 16th Michigan, and they've gotten a lot of play on this video so far, is off in that direction. And then we think the 44th New York, whose monument you see there, is probably be roughly behind this stone wall here. In any case, somehow we have to go all the way down the hill, and we'll see it soon, but it's way down there to see the 83rd Pennsylvania's monument. So, it appears that the Union line is curving because we know that the 20th Maine on the end of the Union line there is going to take position up on that spur there. So somehow the 83rd Pennsylvania is going to be connecting um, these two parts of the hill. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are some stone walls um, over here, and I said that they were built after the battle. They were also largely built by um, troops who were not here during the actual battle for Little Round Top. These are reinforcements, some from Massachusetts, uh, who actually showed up in here, and I thought I would take you through some of this brush. I hope that some more of this brush is actually removed um, as part of the rehabilitation effort. We shall see. I've seen a lot of the park's plans, but um, I haven't seen all of them, the most updated version of it. So we're going to put it in their hands, that it is in their hands anyway, and we'll hope of just for a, for a result of something that lasts and something that is meaningful and safe for everybody that comes up here. Now, the reason I was talking about those Massachusetts soldiers is that they actually used to have plaques, markers up here along the position they occupied after the Battle of Little Round Top. And while the plaques are no longer here, we do still have two of these posts here on which the plaques used to sit. This was for the 18th and the 22nd Massachusetts. You know, this is one of my favorite views of Little Round Top, and most people don't come down here, so that's in part the purpose of this particular video. Moving our way down the hill, some cool uh, early park interpretation. We have one of our old <laughs> posts here. We would have had signs up in these areas. You can see one of these old posts that are up here. Um, there's another one actually down near where Gary is. Um, we had early park visitors coming along a trolley line at places. The Gerdesburg and Harrisburg Railroad Company created Round Top Park to the northeast of us. Um, so there's people coming out here. They want to see things. So we're going to start to see monuments, markers, tablets, memorials going up all over this battlefield. We'll also see rail stations. We'll see um, uh, uh, restrooms or early forms of it, restaurants, dance pavilions, souvenir shacks, and of course, photography studios. Uh, so it's a really interesting place to be uh, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s to see how the park eventually evolves. But this is the land. This is right on the front lines or roughly the front lines of where Vincent's Brigade fought on July 2nd, 1863. You've probably walked over to Vincent's, or I'm sorry, over to Chamberlain's position with the 20th Maine, but most likely you didn't walk down here in and amongst the rest of the brigade. Yes, there's more to the story. Chamberlain is one of those heroes of Little Round Top, but he's not the savior of Little Round Top. It took a lot of people like Governor Kimball Warren, Charles Hazlitt, Patty O'Rourke, Strong Vincent, and many others to come up here and secure Little Round Top for the Federals for the rest of the battle. So keep that in mind. There's always a little bit more to the story. Chamberlain, who's trained in rhetoric and is a prolific writer, is really good at telling his story. Um, and it's a compelling story, no, no doubt. But even uh, some folks uh, question, even amongst his unit, some of the uh, <laughs> artistic prose that he is going to use during the battle uh, or in the post-war years talking about the battle. Here's again one of those uh, posts that we had up here. If you would have been up into this area um, in the early 1900s, there actually used to be a shack up here. Um, it was initially down in Devil's Den, placed by Levi Mumper, um, who opens a photography studio as well as a souvenir stand. And eventually it's moved up into this area whenever the um, National Park Service uh, takes over, specifically the War Department, I should say, takes over Gettysburg National Military Park. Um, you can see we're heading down between the two hills here. We're heading down towards 
the saddle as it were between big round top and little round top which one do you think is bigger big round top of course uh sometimes that stumps folks whenever you talk to them if you ask them what why do they call it the emmitsburg road that's out in front of us uh, they look at you funny well the road went to emmitsburg so you named it that same with the tawny town road the baltimore pike takes you to baltimore so sometimes they name things uh just as simple as possible uh, because it does exactly what it says the road to emmitsburg goes to emmitsburg the road to tawny town goes there uh, so as we make our way down here, you can see just how broken up this land is. These are some of the cooler flank markers um, up here on the battlefield. You can see the Maltese cross here this, to the uh, 83rd Pennsylvania. You can see the, the Maltese cross. You can see telling you the left of the 83rd Pennsylvania. It's tough to read here, but a really cool marker. Um, there are more than 1,400 monuments markers tablets out in these battlefields the vast majority were placed by the federal government the war department they're going to place tablets across these these fields um and going to uh, create what we call war department markers some people call them tablets uh, and the idea was to tell the story of the battle uh, from the army level all the way down to battery levels and you would have a commission who is going to approve What's going to go onto these tablets? There's one right ahead of us to Evander Laws all Alabama brigade who fought here on little round top And these are all over the park and these war department tablets are the backbone of the interpretation of the park Very informational very dry information, but it's going to tell you um, who fought here the units the basically a breakdown of what days they were engaged on the battlefield as well as a lot of times the casualties of those units so if you see uh, a black tablet like this this is going to be to one of our confederate units on the battlefield if you see a bronze one uh, with a marbled base underneath it you'll those are probably for our union uh, or federal or northern units that were out on the battlefield and they have varying shapes and sizes um, out here and each one of them tells again a different story kind of like the 9th pennsylvania reserves a pittsburgh unit um, that has one of the most poignant memorials on the battlefield they come out here after the fighting on july 2nd to help reinforce little round top uh, but you can see a soldier here uh, looking down at what, what seems to be uh, the grave of another soldier. Uh, you can see the 5th Corps Maltese Cross. These are part of the Pennsylvania Reserves, also known as the 38th Pennsylvania Infantry. And this is the saddle between Little Round Top and Big Round Top. Um, we are along Warren Avenue, named after Governor Kimball Warren, the chief uh, engineer of the chief topographical engineer of the Army of the Potomac. And from our right to our left, as you're looking here, this is how the Confederates attack. From the right, we'll start to see Alabamans coming down of Evander Law's brigade. Not all at once. Uh, it'll be actually a staggered formation coming down uh, off to the right here, off of Big Round Top. Company A, the 15th Alabama is left up there. They're going to come down here, eventually sweep up and hit that very now famous position up on the hill there. And that is where the 20th Maine was positioned. One interesting point as we come up here is that we are coming very close to the location of what was called Blind Davy Souvenir Stand. And hardly any people walk this part of the hill, but let me just pause for a second and show you a little bit more. This is what the 47th Alabama and the 4th Alabama would have seen in front of them as they were ordered to attack this hill. Look at this height here. Look at all the places for the defenders to hide. Uh, I guess attackers could too, as long as they got close enough. In any case, here is the area of Blind Davy's souvenir stand. Uh, Davy was not blind when he was working uh, on some stuff in the park and some dynamite exploded and it blinded him for life. They felt bad for poor Davy Weikert, so they allowed him to operate a souvenir stand, Blind Davy's souvenir stand, right here on the slopes of Little Round Top. You're talking about ice cream, uh, uh, sandwiches, uh, beverages and whatnot, and you can still see some little remnant here of the either sewage or the well for uh, Blind Davy's souvenir stand. You can see Chris White over there at the 83rd Pennsylvania Monument there. As we walk up Warren Avenue, this avenue was constructed in 1902. 
Um, there were 10 roads leading into Gettysburg, and some of those are the ones you use while you go around the battlefield, but some of those as well, um, the ones you go around the battlefield are called avenues, and most of those avenues were built for people like us, for visitors to come and access the battlefield. Why save the land if you can't provide access? But if you do provide access, you inherently change that battlefield for some time. If you're going to do that, uh, you know, you're constantly measuring access versus preservation. The American Battlefield Trust, with whom you are today on this particular uh, walk around Little Round Top, faces this with great frequency as I show you the monument to the 9th Pennsylvania Reserves. These are, again, some of the reserve troops who are going to come up here and actually steady the Union line um, on the night of July 2nd, morning of July 3rd, against Confederates who are reorganizing down there at Devil's Den and on the slopes of Big Round Top. You can see it right here. And there actually is fighting on Big Round Top on July 2nd and on July 3rd. So this is, you're getting your first close-up view of Vincent Spur. We've talked about it already, but here it is. You could see that if the Union just tried to occupy the crest of Little Round Top and swung around it, the Confederates could occupy this spur as sort of a stepping stone to occupy the crest. The Union had to occupy this. Strong Vincent in command of the braid clearly recognized this, and he is going to place, uh, you know, first they say the 16th Michigan over there, but ultimately they'll move the 16th Michigan and place the 20th Maine right over here. Um, and the 20th Maine will, of course, go on to fame because for about an hour, or maybe just a little bit less, they are the left flank of the Union Army of the Potomac, the principal army in the east uh, for the Union, and there they are. And the Confederates, incredibly, their right flank, are coming right down Big Round Top here. That's right, these two mighty armies, the right flank of one and the left flank of another, will meet on almost the exact same ground here on Little Round Top. And this portion of Little Round Top has changed dramatically. Um, what you're looking at is actually Chamberlain Avenue. It's an unused avenue. Today it's part of a walking trail system up here on Little Round Top. And Chamberlain Avenue was one of the early park avenues installed in this area. If you walk up onto Little Round Top, you'll see a crisscross zigzag uh, maze of roads all coming together. Uh, we have Wright Avenue to my left. In front of us, we have Warren Avenue. Uh, we have the old Chamberlain Avenue here. And the idea was these they had these newfangled machines in the early 1900s known as automobiles. So you want to get people out into the battlefield, what do you do? You put roads in. But it's a highly destructive process that comes out here. They grade this area. They dig into the ground. They put heavy rocks in there, and they level everything out. So you can see the road in front of us here. This is the walking trail today. That is actually going to do a lot of damage. This is going to change the actual topography of Little Round Top. So it didn't look this flat out here. Now Gary's up towards the 20th Main Monument. That is uh, about the apex of their line. If you uh, watch the movie Gettysburg, read the book The Killer Angels or anything else, you'll know that they are going to extend their line into essentially a V um, or small V and or an L and it's going to meet right at that point. That'll be the apex of it. Now off to here into the woods, um, we have a, a small trail, which wasn't always here. And this trail is going to lead us out to uh, another portion of Little Round Top. Remember, Confederates, they're, they're trying to attack the Union force here. They're trying to get around their left flank. And to do so, you have to find that left flank. Um, so, so as they're coming out into this area, uh, what you're going to start to see are Union and Confederate forces. Um, they are going to try to keep extending their lines. The Federals, the Confederates will do the same thing. And the Confederates will be sweeping out into this area. Um, these are some of the horse trails that we have down in here. So we have Confederates trying to work their way into this area and then eventually up onto Little Round Top, try to find that left flank of the Federal forces that are up there. Uh, so that's part of the, their job out here uh, to, to find that flank. These Alabamians, the 47th, the 15th Alabama, uh, who are in this sector uh, of the line. So that's what you start to see out here is this, this searching uh, for, for one side or the other. Remember, we have no horsemen out on this part of the battlefield, no cavalry troopers who are out here to uh, try and scout for the Federals or for the Confederates. So this is gonna make a big problem for it. So you have to do it with, with uh, men on foot. And you can see 
just what some of this terrain looks like. Confederates talk about having to break up into small groups, as do the Federals at times, because you cannot have one continuous line out here, because you have these massive boulders in front of us. It at least gives you some cover and concealment as you move forward, but it's tough to move across this land, um, and it is a definite change in topography between the north end of the battlefield and the south end of the battlefield. Now walking over toward the left flank of the 20th Maine, but the left flank when? Let's talk about that really quickly because at first, this monument marks the approximate left flank of uh, Joshua Chamberlain's 20th Maine. He's the Colonel of the 20th Maine. So the 20th Maine is lined up over here, connecting with or approximate, like connecting with the 83rd Pennsylvania over there. And here come the rebels. You got the 47th and 15th Alabama coming in this way. They smack into each other. After a few attacks, the Alabamians are starting to move off through the woods where Chris White is moving right now. And they are starting to extend their lines here. So the 20th Maine will famously now bend back. They're going to extend their line to more than its original length and then bend it back this way. Now, this stone wall, the stone wall over there, none of those were here um, at the time of the fighting here. But we, we do know that the Union did extend their line off in this direction here. And that is why we come over here. It is marked by a low stone wall as well as the flank marker of the 20th Maine. So... When the Confederates launched their attack from this direction, it's a big misunderstanding for most people that come here that the Confederates are actually out there. And while they're out there, someone beyond, somewhere beyond them are some United States sharpshooters and one company of the 20th Maine, the famous Company B um, in, in that area. I think that's under the command of a guy named Marill, but I could be wrong going without my notes here like I always do. There is the left flank marker of the 20th Maine. So you see the 20th Maine will go to the monument over there and then bend back. Back. The Confederates push it so tightly that this wing begins to fall back until the wing of the 20th Maine behind me and the wing uh, here are almost back to back. The Union line is pressed to the maximum. Uh, they keep pushing the Confederates back. The Southerners are forming for one final charge off in that direction when famously the 20th Maine puts bayonets on the end of their guns and they charge down. They famously, what do we call it? Swing like a door off in that direction. And when they got far enough, the right side of the regiment also charged forward and this was just these confederates who had stayed up all night who had marched further than any southerners to get here that day who were carrying 57 pounds of stuff each on the second hottest day of the summer many of whom didn't have any water in their canteens had finally had enough and they are going to retreat back up big round top could you imagine and for that reason many of them will be captured and from what i've read somewhat happy to be captured because they could finally stop moving maybe get themselves some water the 20th maine flushed with victory pushes on to big round Roundtop. So does the 83rd Pennsylvania. Then reserves go up there and up here, and Little Roundtop appears to be safe, at least for the moment. Let me show you a little bit more of this part of the battlefield here. The Confederate commander in this area, sort of commanding a demi brigade, you could say, or just his own regiment, William C. Oates, um, was grieved to know that his brother, who was not feeling well and shouldn't have gone into the battle in the first place, went into the battle and uh, was killed uh, during this battle. And Oates always wanted to erect a marker to him here, what was within Union lines, and that was just not allowed under the rules. Uh, you have a commission uh, under the U.S. government that consisted of two Union commissioners and one Confederate commissioner. Wonder who's going to win that vote. Plus, there was real objections from Joshua Chamberlain, who said, no, you pushed us back, but you were never within our lines. We will not allow you to place a monument there. No, sir. So uh, you have veterans arguing with veterans uh, on the, in the same army or across armies as well. It was something that was somewhat common at the time. The rules even before that said that the battlefield of Gettysburg will be marked mainly on your main line of battle. Unfortunately for the Confederates, their main line of battle is a mile away. Since they did most of the attacking, most of the monuments where the fighting are, are to Union units because they stayed on the defense in their main line of battle here. I'm going to keep walking. It looks like Chris and I have lost sight of one another and of many things in the process. <laughs> you're with the American Battlefield Trust. We hope you're enjoying this walk around um, Little Round Top uh, as a replacement until you can get here again and maybe as a poor substitute um, while they are doing the rehabilitation of Little Round Top, which will last some time. Again, this is uh, March of uh, 2022, and they're just about to close Devil's Den and Little Round Top not long after that as I focus here on the flank marker to the 20th Maine. Now, you see a flank marker there. 
and you'd have to go 80 yards before you come upon the flank next flank marker over to the 83rd Pennsylvania. Was there a gap of 80 yards between these units? Of course not. Was there a small gap? Maybe. We really don't know. These troops were only in this position for a short time before they were attacked. Then they come back 10, 20, 30 years later, and we expect them to remember exactly where they fought. Not only that, exactly what they did, who was on their right, who was on their left. And their, you know, this video is in fact going to be longer than many of the soldiers, a longer amount of time than many of the soldiers even spent up here on Little Round Top during the battle. So wrap your brain around that and imagine one of the most intense moments of your life um, unfolding before you and see how much of that you remember with great clarity one year, let alone 25 years later when you come back to erect a monument when all you see are trees and boulders at that time. We're gonna take a walk down here, down along this trail. Um, we're actually finding what eventually becomes the Union left flank. We talked about the Union left flank a lot. It keeps moving. Um, and this is actually um, something that happens in the midst of the battle. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the uh, now uh, the, the newest Colonel in the Army of the Potomac, decides when he is placed on the left end of the federal line that he is worried that uh, Confederates will come around his flank. So what does he do? He decides to send some men over in this direction along a low stone wall, um, Company B under Captain Walter Morrill. Um, they are gonna move over into this area. They're gonna find some of the sharpshooters of Homer Staunton of the second United States sharpshooters. And they are going to come up onto this point. They're um, going to actually hunker down in this area and as they hunker down, what they're going to do is wait for a prime opportunity to strike the Confederates in their uh, right flank. So this is the position of Company B, 20th Maine, who now, along our lines, is our new left flank of the Army of the Potomac. It's hard to see, even this time of year, up towards the 20th Maine's position to actually see where they are. During the fight, you're gonna be able to find them very easily because a uh, little round top's gonna look like a volcano. Uh, you'll be able to see the smoke from the guns uh, firing because we don't have smokeless black powder yet. Uh, we also don't have uh, or we don't have smokeless gunpowder yet. We also have flames coming out of the end of the guns when they discharge. You can hear the cacophony of battle out here. So uh, Morrill's men will wait until an opportune moment and then they're gonna fire into the Alabamians. The Alabamians will come up the hill time and time again. Eventually they're exhausted. They had marched 24 miles to get to Gettysburg. And then they have to march farther to get into position. They sent about 22 men off with their canteens to get water on this hot July day. Those guys do not return, and now they have to attack after this long march without water up towards Little Round Top. Uh, they get close, they get inside of the lines of the 20th Maine. It's different points, but eventually, uh, and the story <laughs> changes between who you talk to. Eventually, though, Chamberlain's going to call for the bayonet, that long knife-like implement, place that on the end of the guns. And then, uh, according to some, uh, a man named Holman Melcher, a lieutenant, just turned 22 years old a few days before the Battle of Gettysburg, jumps to the front and starts screaming, come on, boys, come on, boys, come on, boys, and starts leading a charge down the hill. And eventually, the rest of the 20th Maine figures out what's going on. Others say that Chamberlain, especially Chamberlain himself, jumped to the front and started leading a charge. Um, so a little bit of controversy, even amongst the ranks of the 20th Maine, of actually what happened out here. So it's always interesting to try to piece back together in this post-war years, um, what may or may not have happened out here. And, you know, sometimes old army grudges come back to, to haunt people and sometimes jealousy comes out. So you never know exactly who's telling the full truth, who may not be telling the truth at all, but it's an interesting story out, out here, the historiography or the story of Little Round Top. All right, now we are on the north slope of Little Round Top here. We wanted to show you a little bit more of the hill. We've shown you the main top, the crest, and we've shown you sort of the north side. We're gonna show you a little bit of the south side and then break here and there and get you onto more parts of the hill. So on this north slope, um, there's all sorts of stuff going on before the battle even starts. You might be able to see two regimental monuments back there. That is the 5th Ohio and the 147th Pennsylvania. They're in the 12th Corps. That's why one of them has a star on it because the 12th Corps, that's their core insignia. And they were here on the night of July 1st. Um, 
Um, they were the first ones to really occupy it here, and so they have their monument there. Later, um, you're going to have the Union, you know, Fifth Corps come up here and occupy Little Round Top. So you've got that going on up here. Long after the battle, you're going to have a park established over here. Why is there a park established over here? Because the Gettysburg Electric Railway, the trolley, which ran across the face of Little Round Top, all went back behind the face of Little Round Top and sort of terminated there. You also had a railroad spur, the Harrisburg Gettysburg Railroad, terminate right back there. The perfect place to get off and have a park. And Round Top Park was right on the other side of this little hill right here on Little Round Top. Uh, you're going to have um, a roller rink behind me. You're going to eventually have a casino, maybe even a brothel. You got two photographic studios, places to eat, and all sorts of things. And it was supposedly beautiful, but it was a commercial enterprise. You know, it was not really uh, on the historical uh, sort of scale. So there was a big fight in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century as to whether Gettysburg would be a giant amusement park um, or some sort of, uh, you know, a historic shrine. We happily know who won, and we're out here on Little Round Top because this is under the stewardship of the National Park Service and because they're going to be closing this time for a while so they can preserve the park. That's really why it's here. So um, we hope you enjoy this video, uh, this whole video, as sort of a poor substitute uh, that might help you to experience Little Round Top even between the gaps when it's closed. Yeah, and, and I would encourage you to head over to, to Culp's Hill uh, for two reasons. First off, you can see the, the main monuments for the 5th Ohio, the Cincinnati Regiment, as well as 147th uh, Pennsylvania over there. Most people know that with a uh, parody field that's over on that side. And also, you can go up onto Culp's Hill, and there's early battlefield preservation movements in that area. Stevens Knoll is one of the first places that's purchased in April of 1864 by the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And of course, something that's going to outrage some of the veterans and the town folks, you will have advertisements on some of the big rocks over there. Um, and I think Gary's favorite one is Hoofland's German bitters, which can clear up dyspepsia, a variety of symptoms, including constant imaginings of evil and depression of spirits. Now, uh, we are standing here on the north side of the hill where there's not a whole lot of fighting, we admit it. This is where the Pennsylvania Reserves came over. This is where the Sixth Corps arrived. And here's the Sixth Corps monument here to a New York regiment. And who is it uh, that's commanding this unit here? This is Colonel Emery Upton. The, the 121st New York saw their first action at the Battle of Salem Church on May May 3rd, 1863, and they were dubbed Upton's Regulars. At first, they loved having them in command because they had this West Pointer. Then they realized, boy, this guy's hard on us. <laughs> but whenever they came into battle, they appreciated the, the training their colonel gave to them. They really don't see any action here at Gettysburg, but that is a hard fighting unit. Now, first of all, I can't believe that Chris talked about Salem Church without going off on a complete tangent. Well done there. That's his jam in part. Um, and, you know, secondly, I hope that when Little Round Top is open again, you will come out here because just look at this view. Let's both film this. We're going to film this double here because what a great view into the Valley of Death over toward Gibbs's battery that we're going to visit, I believe, shortly and over toward the intimidating crest of Little Round Top. We're going to show you all this in a little bit more detail. Now, before we do, I like to talk about these guys. Check it out. Wow, they've got a blue cross on there. It is not a health insurance company. Uh, this is the 3rd uh, Brigade of the 3rd Division of the 6th Corps. And unlike the 121st New York, these guys actually fought on Little Round Top. They are part of Nevins or Wheaton's Brigade. They're going to arrive here uh, late in the battle after the Confederates have captured the wheat field, after they've pushed the U.S. regulars off of that position. Here come the Confederates. We're talking about Kershaw, Sims, Anderson, um, and Wofford's Brigades of Confederates. They are exhausted, but uh, they don't have much in front of them until the Pennsylvania reserves arrive and then when the Pennsylvania reserves arrived here comes this one brigade Nevins and Wheaton and this unit the 98th Pennsylvania got separated from the rest of the brigade that went in there and the 98th charged down maybe even a little bit ahead of the reserves off into here suffering some casualties and helping the reserves to push back this final confederate movement often described I've heard it um, as a wave coming up to a beach not much behind it but it comes up and recedes comes up a little bit more and finally the third second day's fighting ends on this area and this is one of the last actions of the second day in Gettys at Gettysburg on the left flank. One of my favorite quotes of the entire battle is, is written probably from right around where we're standing. It's one of the Pennsylvania Reserves standing up here looking out across the field watching the United States regulars go into action in the wheat field and they said for two years the regulars taught us how to be soldiers and at Gettysburg in the wheat field they taught us how to die like soldiers. Uh, so 
high praise, but unfortunate praise for those regulars who charge down across this valley of death and it's a well-earned name. So this area we're walking out to now is correctly called Gibbs's Ledge. Gibbs, is it Frank Gibbs, Chris? Yes, it is. Uh, is this Frank Gibbs is out here with his battery. You can see they are smooth bore cannons. That means they fired cannonballs. They didn't fire shells. And, you know, we, we have mixed uh, sort of understanding of this. Some people suggest that this battery has a section under a guy named Walworth way down there. Some people suggest he's also got a section that's a part of a battery, usually two guns um, off in that direction. But this is known as Gibbs's Ledge. Ledge. And you can see it's below the crest of Little Round Top. What a cool view this is. And again, a poor substitute for the real thing. But we hope you'll come out here once this is done. Yeah, keep in mind what's happening in front of us uh, out to the west. There's that fight for the wheat field and Confederates are coming through there. We'll have some Georgians under William Wofford. We'll have Kershaw, South Carolinians. We might even have some Mississippians under uh, William Barksdale making their way towards this gun line that was uh, placed up here. This is the backbone of the Union forces up here to try to slow down that Confederate juggernaut that's coming this way. And also it's important to note the wheat field road. That road down there is what is uh, like a fire hose spitting out Union soldiers into the wheat field onto Little Round Top and up onto Cemetery Ridge at points. Very cool. We're going to try to make a little bit closer up this uh, ledge here. We'll see how far we get. There's a little path. I think one of the cool things down here around Gibbs's uh, artillery position are these notches you see in the rocks. You might find these around Gettysburg because to place a monument here, you're going to have to do some excavation. You're going to have to do some work to get these monuments placed on these rocks, not to mention out to them. And there are many quarries around the battlefield. This is not one of the quarries, but you can see some of the work they had to do to get this monument up onto, the, onto that pedestal. I am willing to wager that even Gettysburg enthusiasts, that many of those enthusiasts have not been back here before. Uh, the temperature just went down about nine degrees, not 10, not eight, but nine, as I walked into this little maybe grotto in here. And here, only here, can you see the ledge. Uh, every, almost as large as Devil's Den, or I'll say every bit as large as Devil's Den, um, that separates Gibbs's ledge from the lower crest of Little Round Top. You can see up there a monument we're gonna visit next. You can see the top of the 155th Pennsylvania Monument. Chris, where are they from? I think Pittsburgh. That is Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Even more than Salem Church, Chris White likes Pittsburgh. Just look at this view. All right, here we are up on the ledge of the 155th Pennsylvania as promised. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris White because he likes this unit. So the 155th Pennsylvania, uh, you'll notice that the guy on top of it, he's wearing some baggy pants. He has a little fez on. They're a Zouave regiment. Uh, Zouaves are thought of, at least in the beginning of the war, as an elite regiment. They don't get any more training than anyone else, but they wear some different uniforms. Uh, baggy pants like MC Hammer from the early 1990s, little fez like the Shriners, the guys who drive around in little cars wear. Um, but those guys are gonna come out to war uh, in 1862 and they're going to serve all the way through Appomattox. Uh, so they're here on the north side of Little Round Top um, and this monument out here was placed in 1886 by the survivors of the regiment. Uh, some great accounts of their time out in the field. Really cool unit and you're overlooking one of the best views at Gettysburg anywhere. Um, used to be a road that would come out here and around the, the monument itself. So a lot of visitors, this was their first chance in the early days of battlefield visitation to see this vista uh, up towards the Taj Mahal looking monument, which is the Pennsylvania Memorial, up towards the Kadori Farm, Nicholas Kadori Farm, and then down the Sem uh, Emmitsburg Road and Seminary Ridge. And specifically, this road that Chris was mentioning actually came all the way out to this 
a particular uh, plateau or ledge. In fact, this is where the actual curve was right here. So to be clear, the road went over Little Round Top and then came down right here and it made a little loop right here and you would curve and you're seeing the remnant of that road right here. And then it continued on a curvy path down the road. You know, this was all before automobiles were around. And that was easy enough for a carriage, but a car going 10, 15, oh my God, 20 miles an hour, uh, that was a little bit more of a challenge. So they straightened out a lot of the roads, including Sykes Avenue. Now, we're going to show you a little bit about the front face of Little Round Top, but before we do, I wanted to come over here because this is the 146th New York. This is not part of Vincent's Brigade that took part in the famous fighting over there. This is Weed's Brigade, and Weed's Brigade of Pennsylvania and New York units, including the one Chris just talked about, and this one here, as well as the 91st Pennsylvania and the more famous 140th New York, are going to be occupying this part of the line. Now note that we have this monument here, but somewhere on this monument, it is also going to say from this position Major General Meade observed the battle for a time on July 3rd. That is true. We also know the five other generals that were with him and we are going to uh, pause for a second and then resume in that spot. And I just want to point out on the front side of this monument, you'll see three colonels names, Garrard, Jenkins, and Grindley. Uh, there are not three colonels with this unit here. They're talking about Kenner Garrard, who goes on to brigade command later on. David Jenkins, who assumes command of the 146 New York, killed at the Battle of the Wilderness on May 5th, 1864. And then ultimately their success for, successor, Colonel Grindley. I'm actually going to keep rolling. I think we might be able to get you a glimpse inside this rocky pen where they were. Um, without cutting. Let's see if that's possible. So again, there's the monument. There's the 155th. It is right here inside this rocky pen right here. So you see you're covered by that rock. You can see you are covered by this rock. And here in this pen and around it right here were General Meade, General Crawford, General Pleasanton, General Sedgwick, uh, General Sykes, and I believe I might be missing one, but that's close enough. So you could stand in the footsteps of General George Gordon Meade and so many others during the battle. This whole battlefield is like that. You can simply walk around and be certain that we are walking in the footsteps right now of men of the 146th New York, and that there's a good chance that other um, officers, generals, down to privates, are all going to be down here. Now, I believe our next stop, and we will have to pause, is that. Um, structure there called over the years Devil's Den, the Curious Rocks, um, Natural Rock Arc, and other things. Those rocks are larger than you think. All right, I told you. Uh, these rocks are large. You see, I'm already more than halfway up, and these boulders are huge. And yes, they were here during the battle. Presumably, they've been here for hundreds or more than 100 million years. Again, as the soil eroded and the magma hardened, eventually they are going to tumble down the hill. And this thing is precarious. I imagine you can see it just sitting there. And what a great view from here. I'm sure some of the men of the 146th New York, maybe the 91st Pennsylvania, are occupying this part of the hill. And we're both panning over there because you're just naturally um, attracted to the beauty of this scene right here. I can see the 91st Pennsylvania Monument and I can see General Governor Campbell Warren silhouetted right up there. I can see all sorts of things. I can see the 155th, and as I look off this way, I can see Cemetery Ridge and the Pennsylvania Memorial, and I can see the Valley of Death as I lean in further. So the curious rocks are not only cool to look at from a distance, uh, if you're able to safely do it and the new trails allow you to do it safely after the Park Service is done, we encourage you to come out if you are able. We've been making our way across the hill over here. Uh, you can see the crest of Little Round Top over in my view. You can see Chris White right in front of me there. You can see the 44th New York Monument. And we are standing on the same le uh, level, practically, of the 16th Michigan. And here at last is a close-up version of the uh, 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters Michigan Company Monument. You see with the 3rd Corps uh, insignia there on it. And look at this view of the Valley of Death. We might be able to make one or two more stops here to show you it from even lower down. But as Chris just remarked as we're making our way over here, this is a really big hill. Chris? 
Yeah, I think this is the something that people don't realize from the top. It doesn't look as precarious. When you get down in the valley below, it looks imposing, but once you're, uh, I say we're three quarters of the way up the hill, it's still a lot of hill to go. Um, and so when you're trying to make your way up here, we can't make a straight line. We're two guys. We're not in a, a regiment with 400 men trying to use linear tactics, shoulder to shoulder, marching across this field after we've marched all day in the heat, being shot at in very slippery leather shoes. So take all that into consideration when Whenever you're trying to come up this hill we actually have hiking boots on we don't have all the equipment that they would have uh, and we just have some cameras so it is really it gives you a different perspective than driving up getting out of your car and stepping up to a monument or an overlook and note that our cameras are not nearly as bulky as alexander gardner and matthew brady's were <laughs> that was my nerdy voice uh, i want to point out before we stop here that i see a small little squad of soldiers up there you could say and i see some rather small soldiers up there which might comprise about a company or two here at the battle of gettysburg i see some silhouettes over there i'm pointing this out because we have an opportunity while you stand down here to see what small groups at least of union soldiers peeking up among the rocks might have looked like and we're doing it from halfway up the hill we're on a level of the hill that only members of the fourth texas actually reached that somewhat behind uh, where i stand right now yeah and gary brings up a good point think about the civil war soldiers tendency to shoot high you fight in shoulder to shoulder two ranks deep so when you're firing over someone's shoulder you're naturally going to aim up a little bit but then you have to fire uphill uh so it's going to be a tougher target so these guys are going to shoot high a lot so think about the amount of ammunition that's expended out here to just to, sh to, to shoot one man um i saw a study many 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 years ago that claimed that to kill one civil war soldier you needed to fire 140 pounds of lead that's about the average weight of a man at the time of the Civil War. We're not talking about great shots out here. Because we're sort of flying here, I thought I'd give you an idea of what it might look like to peek over a breastwork, or in this case, a natural fortification that is a rock like this. So let me see if I can not scrape my arm up too bad and actually give you this view where you're not seeing much. And then you stand up a little bit. Join us as we reconvene on another part of the hill. So we haven't moved too far across the face, a little round top, but we're over at the Michigan Sharpshooters Monument. Um, this is actually along Vincent Spur, what we call Vincent Spur. Just off in the distance, you might be able to see the 16th Michigan Monument. And then on the top of the hill, the large castle-like monument of the uh, 44th New York, the 12th and 44th New York Monument up there. Um, you're facing relatively east in this direction. Now we're looking a little bit towards the south. That's where the Confederates are coming from. Uh, you're looking specifically at about the 4th Alabama Alabama which on this portion of uh, the, the battlefield would be the left flank of Evander Law's brigade. He brings three Alabama regiments up over Little uh, Big Round Top towards Little Round Top. Down in the valley below, we'd have two more of his regiments, the 48th, 44th Alabama. They're fighting down in Devil's Den. Now you're looking south, southwest. That's Devil's Den out there in the distance, about 800 yards from where we're standing. Um, then you will see Hawks Ridge. That's the closest uh, ridge line to us, um, and that is facing out to the west. And then, of course, to the north, we'll see the Weikert Farm uh, out there in the distance. Then you'll see up Cemetery Ridge and towards the town of Gettysburg, um, which is just a few miles up the road from where we're standing. But out here on this rock ledge, what you're looking at is where the Michigan sharpshooters were uh, located. This is a tough monument to get out to. There's not a path. We're making our own path out here. You can see that they were attached to the 2nd Brigade, 1st Division, 3rd Corps. Third Corps, we thought the Fifth Corps was defending up here. Well, the Third Corps down in Devil's Den has John Henry Hobart Ward's brigade positioned down there, and he has two U.S. sharpshooter regiments attached to him. One regiment under Casper Trepp, Lieutenant Colonel Casper Trepp, is fighting out uh, in an area known as Pitzer's Woods, out near where the James Longstreet Monument is today. Then out in front, along the Bushman and Slider Farms, we have the second United States sharpshooters under the command of Major Homer Stoughton. Uh, if you go out that way, you'll see a Vermont monument to the sharpshooters. So up here on Little Round Top, what happens is these sharpshooters are acting as skirmishers, guys that are your feelers of your army. They're going to start to slow down these Confederates and fall back, fall back, fall back, and finally find this position here up on Little Round Top, falling in with Vincent's Brigade of the 5th Corps. We're also looking up towards where the 140th New York Regiment's um, monument is and this is the vicinity where patty o'rourke west point class of 1861 the war class i think he's the june class there's two of them may and june um he is going to uh, graduated at the top of his class killed here in action 27 years old an irish native uh, but you can see out here every company is 
is mentioned uh, we can see that we have company B on this side which is kind of hard to see uh, because it is a sheer rock then we have company C and then on this side we have company I and it's telling us exactly what they did. They fought upon the field at Pitzer's, uh, Pitzer's Run. Uh, they fought at the Scherfee Farm. They fought at different places. And then here's Company K of the first uh, Michigan Sharpshooters. So, uh, or um, Company K of the second U.S. Uh, sharpshooters. Uh, so, representing representing the uh, sharpshooters out here as part of these first and second regiments uh, of the sharpshooters so you can see around here pretty cool to look at um, these guys will fight some of them will fight out at pitzer's woods others will fall back up to this position fighting uh, out along the bushman and slider farms uh, so it's a pretty cool pretty cool monument that you see out here there's company b of the second and then here's company k of the first company i of the first and company c of the first so sharpshooters out in front a uh, really cool view from up here and we're going to keep moving along and see the rest of vincent's line all right, here we are a little bit farther down. We're on the right flank-ish of Strong Vincent's Brigade on Little Round Top. You're roughly looking south, southeast in this direction. You're looking right in front of you at the 16th Michigan Monument. Up behind it is the 44th New York Monument, and that is the crest of the hill. You're looking towards the west. I'm sorry, the east. Uh, now you're looking towards the north, northeast, back towards Gettysburg now. I can see Governor Kimball Warren, you probably can't make him out. Uh, and then you're looking up to the northwest here, out towards Seminary Ridge. Just to give you a little orientation. Again, Devil's Den's roughly 700 yards down in front of us. And then we're gonna make our way over to the 16th Michigan. What happens is we have um, some Alabama troops coming up into this area. Then we'll also have some Texas troops coming up into here. Um, we'll have uh, the 4th and 5th Texas coming up onto Little Round Top. We'll also have the 4th Alabama. Um, we'll have the 15th Alabama, 47th Alabama. Uh, so we have roughly um, five uh, Confederate regiments versus about four Union initially. This is the 16th Michigan. They're down here on this like ta table uh, like service, uh, surface. The 16th Michigan, when they come online, is actually a little bit farther down the line. Um, they're uh, off to our east. And then the 83rd Pennsylvania and 44th New York like fighting beside one another. So they swap around and that puts the 16th Michigan on the right flank. Who's on that left flank? You probably know the name, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Well, down here, is uh, Norval Welsh Jr. Uh, he is the commander of the 16th Michigan, the, th uh, the lieutenant colonel. At some point, we have Confederates forcing their way up this hillside, fighting their way up this hillside, literally and physically. Think about this. You're coming up this hillside, carrying everything that, that you have into battle. Sometimes you lose your packs or put them off to the side. Sometimes you're carrying backpacks and everything that you own in this world coming up this hillside, and it's hot and you have leather shoes that are very slippery. Uh, so as you're coming up here, you're being shot at, and these Texans and Alabamians, as they make their way up here, at some point, someone in the 16th Michigan is gonna order the flags of the 16th to fall back in this position, towards this position uh, up near the 44th New York. When they do that, what ends up happening is the 16th sees their flag going back. If you're in a Civil War battle, you watch your flag. If it's stationary, you stay there. If it moves forward, you go forward. If it goes back, you go back. And as this flags of the 16th start falling back, so do some of the men. Uh, and they try to rally them, and eventually we'll have some New Yorkers come down here to support them. That's Patio Works guys up there where you might see those kids on a field trip. Uh, and then you will also have the 16th come back down into their position or re reconstitute their position and hold out the line. But it's a very close action over here uh, between the Texans and some of the Alabamians coming up on this side of the hill. Um, the 44th and 48th Alabama who are below us, also part of a Vanderlaws Brigade, may have come up into this area. Um, there is uh, some speculation that they did. Some say they did, some say they didn't. They did a lot of hard fighting in Devil's Den, now trying to take on this hill. You know, you couldn't blame them if they did not come up into here. They do secure Devil's Den, the Confederates do. Um, they're gonna uh, turn that into uh, a fortification for many of their sharpshooters. They'll actually be firing up on top of this hill. Um, when Jimmy Carter comes out here, President Carter comes out here um, with a delegation at one point, the Secret Service actually shuts down Devil's Den in the 1970s because they were worried that sharpshooters would pick off the president up here at Little Round Top. That's the impact that the Confederate sharpshooter image had 
all the way from 1863 up to this day. Um, so it's a really interesting spot to come down to. You get a really good perspective. This is roughly the, the table, the spur, whatever you want to call it, of where Vincent's Brigade is positioned. And again, you can visit the 16th Michigan Monument. This is probably one of the easier ones to get down to um, right now because you don't have to cut your own pathway. There is one for you. So I encourage you, if you're able to, check out that 44th New York Monument. But get down here to the 16th Michigan and get right on the battle line. See what these Union soldiers uh, saw. See what the Confederate perspective would be by walking down just a little bit farther and looking up this hill. Here I am more than halfway down the slope of Little Round Top. You can see Big Round Top off in the distance. You see the hill that is sometimes called the Devil's Kitchen right there. You can see Devil's Den off in that direction there, obscured by those pinish short of trees over there. You can see some trees that looks like they might be seeing their last years off in the distance as I pan through the Valley of Death. No Confederate soldiers actually attacked this side of the hill, but the Union was going to be ready for it. And you could see maybe some silhouettes of some bus groups up there, which might approximate, even if a little bit smaller, some of the soldiers that were up there. Missing is the battle smoke rising from what they were shooting up there. Missing is the glistening of their bayonets. And missing is, of course, the screams and shouts of the combatants as they attacked Little Round Top from that side. And as they exchanged uh, skirmish and sharpshooter fire between the hill and then this ridge I'm looking at here, Hauk's Ridge in the distance there, for more than 20 hours after the Battle of Devil's Den. Again, panning across the Valley of Death and now up the lower slopes of Little Round Top from the lower slopes of Little Round Top. I'm not that far above Plum Run at this point, which will be behind me. I'll show you in a sec if we can see it. You can see the sort of uh, edge of the crest of Little Round Top where the 16th Michigan and uh, uh, sharpshooters will be positioned. You can see we're about level with Devil's Den now that you can see off in the distance. This is sort of a little rocky patch. Um, and beyond this rocky patch is Plum Run right over there. Cool part of the hill that you hardly ever get to access. Uh, I'm not sure of the extent of the National Park Service trails once they complete their rehabilitation up here. Um, but if you are able to safely and legally access this later, I recommend walking all parts of Little Round Top because you get an idea of not only what the soldiers did go through, but what the Confederate soldiers were going to have to do were they successful in charging this hike after they crested Hauk's Ridge after the battle for the wheat field, which is right beyond that. See, we're talking about Kershaw, Semmes, Anderson, and Wofford, and they're coming here, and they'd already pushed aside the U.S. regulars, but now here come the Pennsylvania Reserves, really the last thing to finally push the Confederates away. But had they not shown up, the Confederates would have been faced with entering this valley. Some say the Confederates may have gotten as far as Plum Run, enough to lose some of their shoes, and then they would have had to do this. And there were already Union soldiers occupying Little Round Top at that point, even without the Pennsylvania Reserve. So it's very instructive to come down here, beside which it is beautiful, despite the wind. All right, so here we are back on the crest, and we are looking to tie this thing up. We hope you enjoyed um, our sojourn around Little Round Top, and if you didn't, um, we hope you'll tell us uh, that you didn't. If you did enjoy it, tell us that too, so that we can know to make more of these sort of walking GoPro tours, whatever we ultimately call them, walking vodcasts, I think. So thanks to Chris for doing a lot of the shooting. Thanks to whomever ultimately edits this hours long um, video cut. And thanks to you all for watching and for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.